Grace Chapel Fairview, good morning. I hope you're well. It's so good to see you again. I hope you've had an incredible week. I hope you've conquered quarantine in a way you never expected. And for those of you who are barely hanging on and getting through it, those of us maybe who are barely hanging on and getting through it, I want to welcome you to say, hey, you're with family. You're amongst people uh, that love you this morning. Uh, it is exciting to get to gather again. Uh, even though it's virtually, uh, it still feels like we're, we're together um, every single Sunday. And so uh, grateful for that. Um, three things I want to talk to you about before we start our worship experience this morning. Number one, and you guys have been awesome at this, is, is, is be sure to share this story. Last week, tons of people shared it. Lots of people got the word out. And we were able to preach the gospel, send that message out to, to, to literally a couple thousand different people have seen that uh, on the internet. And so what an incredible thing to be able to say. Uh, so we want to invite you again, even right now, use your sphere of influence on your different platforms to share this message, uh, to write a little blurb, and to help other people connect with the church that maybe wouldn't ever before. Another thing is this, that every time, whether we're, we're gathering um, in person or virtually online, we want to make a point to, to pray during church. And not just to say, hey, we said a prayer, but, but to pray for one another. This is uniquely difficult in our, in our current circumstances, but it's not impossible. You see, there are people right now that are in the comments section that want to talk to you, that want to connect with you, that want to pray for you and lift you up. This isn't just about super big things. It could also just be going, hey, I've been, I haven't been conquering this week. I'm struggling a little. I need some help. I need to know that, that I've got some people around me. And they're here. They want to be here for you. Just leave a comment, uh, direct message, or send an email. But, but find a way. Reach out to us and let us know. Uh, and, and I promise you there are people who are going to be praying uh, right now for you. Uh, the scripture says, let my house be a house of prayer. And so we don't want to be um, prayerless in, in our time together. We want to be prayerful. And so uh, the last thing is this, and, and definitely not the least. Uh, giving is super, super important in these times. The scriptures are really clear that, that, that the people of God provide for the house of God, that, that, that we as a community bring a tithe and a tenth. And, and that when we do that, the word of God says that, that he's going to open up heaven on us, that he's going he's gonna to multiply the fruit of our ground. He's going to protect us from the devourer. And, and I don't know exactly what that's going to look like in your context. I know times are hard right now. But I also know that, that being a generous people, even in hard times, is the, the heartbeat of Jesus. And so I, I want to do this, and I want to invite us to do this, to participate in giving and tithing. Uh, and there's different ways you can do that. You can do it online, via text, or the old-fashioned way in the mailbox. That's all great. But let us be known as a generous church as we get to the other side uh, of the quarantine, corona, uh, COVID-19 experience. But we're believing that God's going to do much. He has been, and we know He will continue to do uh, through this church. And so we're so grateful for that. I want to invite you guys to, to grab a notebook, use the restroom, get you a fresh cup of coffee, and let's prepare our hearts to worship King Jesus this morning and believe that He's going to do much in our midst. Amen? We'll see you here soon.
morning, good morning, Grace Chapel, Fairview. Here we are again in our virtual church service. Hey, it's the new norm. We're kind of settling into it and getting used to it. And uh, again, as I said a couple of Sundays ago, I just feel like I can see you sitting on your couches, standing where you're standing, and uh, being with us. It just makes me feel like we're all together. We've talked about it enough, and we've done it enough now. The new norm is kind of settling into getting comfortable. So uh, we appreciate you guys being with us this morning. Thank you so much. And as, uh, as we say sometimes when we're at uh, regular church service and we're all in one room, let's just uh, take a second this morning, and uh, especially under these circumstances when we're uh, together, yet we're not physically together, but we are together. Let's just take a moment and take a deep breath as we prepare to worship. Uh, even though we're, a lot of us are not at our jobs and we're having to stay home a lot right now, there's still a lot going on that distracts us from being spiritually comfortable sometimes. So let's all just agree right now to just take a deep breath and shake off all the craziness going on around us and know that God's in control. And just claim that right now as we prepare to worship and to praise Him. Those who feel like it out there, I'm going to ask you to do something because uh, when we do this, it's like committing to, like, I'm ready. I'm going to worship. I'm all in. I love the phrase, all in. So if you feel like it this morning, I want to encourage you to stand up right there in your living room. Just to stand up and join us just like we do when we're all together in the same room. I can see you. I can see you. All right, let's worship this morning as we praise God and as we say in prayer even right now, God, we love you. We send out our thanksgiving first. First and utmost, Father, we lift our thanksgiving to you. Just like in times of old, just like the scripture says. It is powerful to be thankful first, and we are genuinely thankful first this morning. We say, God, come be with us. We long for your presence this morning. We love you, and right now we worship you. We worship you, Father. Jesus, you are the one who saves. You are the one who saves, and we lift that up to you right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's sing. Yes. Yes. We will be joyful, yeah. You are the one. You are the one who saves. Let's sing joyful, joyful. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of all. Hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of eternal gladness, You are the one who saves. You are the one who saves. You are the one whose hands lift us from the grave. You are the light of life, the everlasting day. You are the one who takes. ever blessed fountain of the joy of living ocean lips of happy rest you are the one who saves you are the one who saves you are the one whose hands lift us from the grave Everlasting days, you are the one. 
our sins away. You took our sins away, Lord. You are my rescue, Lord. My one and only rescue, Lord. Yes, you washes over us. Yes. Alone in my sorrow. Alone in my sorrow in dead in my sin. Yes. Lost without hope no place to begin. Your love made a way and let mercy come.
life begin, Lord. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. This morning, I know that uh, I know that when we're all assembled together, we we have a, a prayer time at this point, and we just wanna we wanna have one this morning. And uh, you know, Pastor Ian does a great job of, of inviting people to uh, send their prayer request in. You know, and, that, and that's that's what we want. We we want want you to know we're here for that. Uh, and we say it, you know often but I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you and it's it's back to that same thought you know we're not meant to do this alone and again in this um, social distancing era we're living in it, it just rings even louder and clearer we're not meant to do this alone you know Christianity is not a, a Hollywood movie where 007 or Mission Impossible you know the movie where one guy comes in he saves the world Jesus saved the world so reality is much different. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now that's what we're going to talk about just a little bit. Okay, how do we fight and destroy a stronghold? Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Okay. You may be sitting there or standing there going, you know, how do I make God my stronghold? Well, one way is like this. Here's God, okay? And in our walk, if we haven't become a Christian yet, if we haven't confessed his name Pastor Ian was talking a lot about that last Sunday and it's to we're here for you for that we can facilitate that and help you with that so if you, if you haven't made that step please do we beg of you it's the greatest decision you'll ever make and if you're in your walk let's say God is here and you're here okay let me give you this illustration if we're walking away from God how can we come to him with a problem of a stronghold or anything else in our life that's chaining us down how can we do that if we're walking away I walked away one time that's the story of the prodigal son that's my story and many other stories please don't do that and if you are walking away let him get your attention and come home come home so if you're not walking away you're saying okay I'm walking with him but what happens is it's happened in my life it happens from time to time you're walking parallel with him but you're not close enough you're still not walking towards him so I'm walking parallel with God here and I can see him and I can hear him but I can't see him clearly even though I can see him I can't hear him clearly even though I can hear him so if we want to get rid of strongholds if we want the stronghold of our life to be our Lord and Savior walk towards him yes that can be hard to take steps that actually put you closer to Jesus you may be like I don't know I do that it's really hard you know but when we get to him we get closer to him just take we're all taking walks on our street right now in our neighborhoods and you get to a curve you come around it, you can see all everything that was around the curve you couldn't see things become clear the closer you get to the end of the street and the closer you get to that end of the street to your destination when you get closer and closer everything becomes so clear well that's what happens the closer we get to God the clearer the plans he has for our lives to bless us and prosper us, to give us peace that we'll never be able to understand it so peacefully, to give us joy in all circumstances. That's what happens. Every step that we get closer to God, 
he becomes clear. What he's trying to tell us and show us becomes so much clearer. But we have to make that effort to come towards him. Okay, you're going to say, well, that's hard. And yes, it is. You've been there, and we'll be there again someday. It's hard. It's hard. In our walk, we're constantly getting veering off the path and not walking straight towards him. What we want to do is be with him, walk shoulder and shoulder, not get ahead of him, not be behind him. That's the goal. And you're saying, well, that takes, I don't know if I can do that. Well, it takes faith, doesn't it? It's kind of like the uh, Levi priest when they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And they stepped into the River Jordan. They had to plant their feet firmly on the bottom in the water as the river raged in flood stage before the water would part. But as they did, they took that leap of faith and they stepped into it. It's hard, but that's what we have to do. We have to have that faith that that's what's going to happen when we walk closer to God. We're going to be the, we're able to see Him clear and His plans for us clear. And we're going to be able to see clearly how He can effortlessly destroy a stronghold. So, if you need prayer for anything this morning, there are prayer warriors standing on guard right now. Just as Joshua in three chapters 3 and 4 rallied the troops. That's what we do every Sunday morning. We rally the troops. Just like Joshua looked behind him and all of a sudden he had because of the promises that God gave him and what he told them, 400,000 men stood behind him. Every Sunday morning we rally the troops and we call our troops the prayer warriors because they are. They've lived so many things, so many more than you can imagine. They understand. And they're right there waiting for you to put in a prayer request. You can just type it in. And they will go to battle for you. So, I want to encourage you. You're not going to scare these prayer warriors. You're not going to have to worry about them judging you, putting you down, or talking about you. We just want to privately, discreetly pray for you. Again, we're just not meant to do this alone. so much power attached to it. Yes. The apostles would say, in the name of the Jesus, rise up and walk. There is power in His name. As we say so many times, when you don't know what to say, if you can just say His name, there is power in the name of Jesus. Let's sing it. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. Yeah. 
redemption heaven's gates swing away there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus yes there is Jesus. 
is power in the name of Jesus. Claim that there is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord, you break every chain. that you break every chain, Lord. God, thank you for the breaking of chains that you've done in my life. And thank you, God, that I can take comfort and solace in the thought that the next chain that comes along, you can break that one too. There's no mountain high enough. There's no valley deep enough that you're not there and that your power is not equally the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, we claim right now that you are the same God who parted the Red Sea. The same God who said, open your eyes and see. Rise up and walk, lame man. God, we love you. Father, as we transition into the Word this morning, we ask you to continue to be with us. Bless the word this morning. Bless the giver of the word, Pastor Ian, as he presents that holy word, that beautiful love letter. A portion of the story of Jesus and how much he loves us. Father, we run after you this morning. We say that we're going to walk towards you not far enough away that we can't see or hear you, but we're going to walk towards you until we get right up by your side, and then we're going to walk with you and not ahead of you, not behind you. We just want to be right in step with you, Father. We want to know that we're accomplishing the plans that you have for our lives, much greater, much better than ours. Father, again, just be with us this morning. Throughout the continuation of this service, we love you. Jesus, in your mighty name we pray these things. Amen. I want to start this morning by asking a question. Have you ever been put in a situation where you had no idea what you were really supposed to be doing? I would love to use y'all's story instead of my own because sometimes it's embarrassing to just keep revealing how many times I felt awkward throughout my life. But, but I want to tell you guys... Um, uh, about my experience really close right after again we could we could go to all different places lots of times in my life where I where I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do but but right after I got saved like like weeks after I got saved I, I fell in love with Jesus I was forgiven of my sins I was excited about the word I was eating it up and 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 just pumped up to share the story of the gospel with whoever would listen and someone came and whispered in my ear and said, Hey, Ian, 
there is a group of guys who are, who are longing and hungry to be discipled over at Grace Chapel. It, it's the group of eighth grade boys in the middle school ministry. They're looking for a guy who's willing to pour the life of Christ into them and, 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 and talk about the Bible and disciple them. And, and I literally, y'all, and, and I'm not saying this any, with any facetious, like I, I literally thought I had struck gold. There were going to be 12 boys, 12 hungry young men that, that, were, that were longing to hear the gospel preached and, and to grow in the, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And, and like I said, I had, I had just been saved myself, and so I, I didn't know how to do it. I, I didn't know what it was going to look like. All I knew is these boys needed somebody to take them toward Jesus, and I was the man. Now, little did I know that there is always always an opening in middle school boys ministry because they you know it's kind of like not something that people stick around for the long haul for but 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 I didn't I didn't realize that back then so all I knew is 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 my 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 thought my imagination what I believed was about to happen was I was going to show up at this church that I had just been saved at about a month prior I was going to show up at this church and I was going to have 12 young men 12 moldable young minds that were starving for the living water of Christ. And I was going to get to meet with them every single week for an hour. And then outside of the, the church, we were going to grow together. We were going to run after the kingdom together and, and probably start a church. Like, who knows? Like, this was going to be a, a, a world-changing group of young men. That was my imagination. And then I actually showed up. To, to, to walk out this, uh, this experience. And my imagination met my reality. You see, I was keenly aware when I walked through the doors to see a hundred or so teenagers, I was completely out of my element. I had no idea what to do. I didn't know what these guys needed. And much less, they weren't like hungry and starving for the word. They were actually like psychotic, pubescent teens that were like talking about their farts and, 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 and wanted to torture each other until they cried. And it was a far cry from what I had expected to see when I came into my first kind of discipleship opportunity. I had no idea what to teach. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea how to get them to stop punching each other in the arm. All I knew, I was in the middle of a situation, and I had no clue what to do. And so I had to start asking this question, how do I? I would go to Jake, who was the youth pastor at the time. I would go to other mentors and go, hey, how do I teach somebody about this thing that I learned in the Bible? How do I do this? How do I teach them about prayer? How do I? And, and I found myself constantly asking people this question, how do I do this? Because it was the only question that would get me from where I was to where I wanted to be, to be able to actually take what I had been offered and do something with it. And I think we are in a unique season of our world as we are literally doing church online, house to house. I believe the world has slowed to a pace where all of a sudden it's, it's right and good for us to maybe start asking some questions like, how do I actually do this? Because I think if we're really honest, I think if we, we, we really get real with one another, that, that we could be, be transparent enough, at least here, you know, it's just us watching, to say, I'm not sure how to do all this Christian stuff. And so over these next few weeks, I want us to, to take time to, one, learn from the Word of God as the source of truth what the Scriptures say about how to do foundational parts of the Christian life. We're going to look at things from prayer to worship to finances to relationships. And I believe through this time, the word of God can come alive and we can start to ask some questions about how we are to navigate such a, uh, an unprecedented time like this. And I also believe because this word is living and true that through the process, we're going to gain tools. We're going to be equipped to navigate not just the quarantine season, but the seasons that are to come. Because as we ask the question, how do I do this? 
I believe God is going to equip us just like he did me back then. I walked in. I had no idea what I was doing. I had never been around teens. I had never been around kids. I just knew that I, I loved Jesus and I wanted to tell people about him. And through the process of asking questions, partnering with the right people, learning, looking up and going, hey, I don't know how to do this, but they do. And I want to be around them walking through discipleship. I spent the next 10 years of my life seeing not just those boys, but hundreds, maybe even a thousand or more students come through this ministry and see their life change for the gospel. I've seen kids go on to do incredible things for the kingdoms, missionaries all over the world, not because of, of, of what I taught them, but, but because I showed up. And, and because we were a, a group of people that kept showing up and, 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 and loving them and nurturing them and pointing them to the, to the cross. And, and over time, we became not just, uh, I wasn't just sitting around going, I don't know what to do. I actually figured out kind of how to do it. And so I believe that in this season, as we navigate these times, as we look to the word of God and ask the question, how do I do this or do that? Live this Christian life in this season and this time. I think the word of God is going to illuminate in us a heart to, to not just survive, but to thrive in this season. And again, as we, as we navigate these, these times, I believe that we're going to have time. We're going to have, have space in our life to explore uh, things that maybe we haven't ever explored before. We can deep dive into scriptures uh, about what it looks like to live the kingdom life and be a believer in this time. I, I know sometimes I look back on my early Christian life and go, man, I just wish somebody like, I wish that I could, I knew like somebody would tell me like, how do I do this? And so that's what this is all about. Um, and we're going to navigate all these different topics um, and, and, and go from place to place knowing that this is the pathway to answering these how do I questions that, that lead us toward the abundant life that Jesus offers. But today I want us to start by laying a really solid foundation. Today is, is going to be quick, it's going to be simple, but but the whole idea is that we would take a minute and go, hey, before I ever ask any questions that involve the word I, I need to know a few foundational pieces because we cannot, we cannot develop a belief system that, that I need to take it up on my shoulders, that I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps and, and get to work and then I'll arrive. No, this is all building off of the foundation of last week that Jesus and his sufficient work on the cross is all we need. And that as we look back to him and as we, we keep that at the forefront of our mind, it will empower us to live the life he's called us to live. So I want us to look at two quick verses today as we lay our foundation for the How Do I series. Number one is this. This, this is familiar for some of us. Second Peter Chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Peter says, His, meaning Jesus, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. So listen to me. It's His divine power. It's all about Jesus. It doesn't say He gives us, um, you know, that, that, that our divine wisdom that our Christian ethics, that our church attendance gives us all things for life and godliness. No, no, no. It says his divine power, the power of Jesus living, dying, raising again, and living through us is the empowerment that gives us, the people, all things. Listen, this is a cheesy, Christi a, 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 a cheesy preacher joke, but what, what does the word all mean? It means all, everything, all that pertains, everything that is there, everything you're going to need to live and, and, and to be a godly person is obtainable through the person of Jesus. There is nothing that is out of reach for you. Some of you guys are going, well, yeah, I'm just, I'm not like you, preacher. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I do this. I don't live that. I don't, I don't just, I don't, I don't live that all the time. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm barely showing up to church and I'm just telling you, I don't care if you're a, a pastor on, on a, on a screen right now or, or you're sitting in your living room, barely 
barely showing up to church. Jesus has given you all things for life and godliness. Everything you need to live life. So when we start to ask the question, how do I? We need to always remember the answer is he did it. He gave it to us. It's found in him. Now, figuring out where it is is a different story. But the truth is, is that it is in Jesus, that, that he has given us all things for life, to live, to function, to, to, to do. We'll talk more about this in a minute. And to be a godly person. You see, I, I, think, I think maybe the, the thing that I'm realizing is, is life has slowed down, is, is, is the pace of the world has kind of come to a halt over these last few weeks, that I'm going, man, I, I, can, I, can't, I can't change a lot. I can't fix a lot. I'm not in control of a, as much as my life as I like to imagine I am. But what I can, what I can put my hands on, what I can work toward is to be the kind of person that lives a godly life. I can work towards that. I can put things out of my life. I can stop watching this. I can stop looking at this. I can stop focusing on that and start looking to the things that matter most to fill my life and to fuel my life with God. And so, so that's something I can control. And it's based, again, right there, through the knowledge of Jesus. And so the more we get to know Him, the more we... We learn the sound of his voice, the familiarity of his presence, the more we will inhabit the, the life and godliness that he affords us. And so I want us to, to lay that down as our first brick in the foundation of, of, of how do I do the Christian life? How do, I, how do I walk through these unprecedented times? I have to know that everything I need is in Christ through the knowledge of him. So, so again, I, we say this a lot. But reading this book is not some religious expectation that you've got to get through the Bible this year. And if you don't, you're just a terrible Christian. That, that's nonsense. The truth is, the more you have a knowledge of him, the more you get to uh, embrace the power that gives you life and godliness. And so as we start to ask, how do I? That's step one for sure. It's formative. Uh, and, it, and it's giving us power. The second piece is this. I want us to look at, at Acts chapter 17. Now we're switching over. That was Peter. Now we're looking at, 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 a, at a, an experience with the Apostle Paul where he goes to, to the Aragopis. At, <laughs> I said that wrong. But he's at Mars Hill, and he's talking to the, the philosophical minds of the day. He, he's, he's engaging with uh, kind of a, call it a think tank, the, the philosophers, the, the, the high thinkers, the the, the really smart folks of the day, and he goes to engage them uh, and, and share with them about Jesus. Again, Paul was renowned for this. He could talk to anybody kind of on any different uh, uh, you know, field, and he could, he could share with them about the gospel. And so here he's thinking, and he's, he's, he's walking into a, a, a deeply philosophical place. This would be the equivalent of like, going to a, to a university uh, philosophy department and, and talking to, the, to these great minds about uh, the Savior Jesus. And he's using their own language and he's using some of even their own poets to talk about it. But Acts chapter 17, uh, uh, 22 through 28, we're going to read together. It's a bit long, but I want us to, 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 to look into here and see if we can't see that second foundational piece. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Aragop era. Aeropagus, I can't speak today, and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he made for one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their reappointed time and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him, that they might find him, 
Though, though he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. You see, as Paul is articulating the things of God to these smart, brilliant thinkers, he shares a foundational piece of our story. He shares a foundational answer to the question, how do I? By saying that in him we live and we move, and we have our being. He also goes on to say he, he, he gives to all life and breath and all things. He, he's the animator, right? But the focus is, the second piece is, that in him we live, we move, and we have our being. And it's, it, it, it's important for me as we press into this How Do I series, as we begin to look at all these different topics and, and start to learn kind of foundational lessons about each piece, that we remember that it is in Jesus, it is in the person of Christ that we live. This is the idea of, of, of again, just having life itself. This is a, 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 the, the word meaning kind of an in, a, a purposed existence that, that, that there's no answer to a how do I that doesn't first start with Jesus because apart from Jesus, we can't even live. Then that kind of escalates. He goes, first we, we live in him. The second part is this, that, that in him we move. This is this, this idea that he not only brings us to life, but he gives us motion. He gives us uh, animation. He helps us begin to function. And so, so it's, it's important to note, it's not just that he brings us to life, but he's the one who actually does the moving in our life. So anything we're going to do from learning how to read the Bible, to learning how to pray, to learning how to fellowship, to love one another, to, to steward the finances of our life, Everything we're doing is rooted in him. It is the foundation. And then finally, he says, in him we live, we move, and we have our being. We have our soul. We have our, our, our individuality. We, 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 we exist not just as a, as a life form. Again, last uh, Good Friday, uh, Isaac and Alicia taught us that, that, that atonement wasn't just a thing that was... That was um, for all, but it was individual, specific for you. In him, we live, we exist as humans, we, we move, he, he animates us, but then we have our, our soul, we have our individuality, we have our individual purpose. And, and it's important for us to, 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 to realize that this is, 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 is not this is not something that we, we need to look upon and go, okay, yeah, that's just another good, good, good uh, verse to know. This is the essence. He's talking about the essence of, of how life is really happening. You see, this is about us being ultimately dependent on him. He lays this out and says, basically, God does all of it. God does everything. We can't answer the question, how do I, with anything other than God is doing it? And, and, and we have to maintain that foundation. Family, as we endeavor on this journey of learning these foundational building blocks of how to live this, the, the Christian life in these uncommon times, I can't say enough how much this is all about Jesus. He's where we find life. He's where we find hope. He's where we find everything we need and some of us I, I i know it's true some of us are going well man ian i need i need like stuff and i don't know how could god possibly i'm not trying to make this stuff up i'm telling you what the word of god says that he gives us all we need for life and godliness and in him we live and move and have our being you guys i i, I can't help but but think about it. it's it's as we look at, at stuff like this, as we, as we hear that, I look back to what my life was like before I met Jesus. I remember what it felt like to, to, to not know what my purpose was, to kind of, uh, and, and it was my, my whole life was all about me. It was all about getting what I wanted. It was all about fulfilling the, the desires of, of my flesh, my heart, just whatever. I just, I just wanted to, to focus on me, and I didn't care who I hurt. I didn't care what I did, and constantly I was worried and kind of tormented by this. Per like, 
I don't have any purpose. I don't have any, like, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't know where I'm going or why I'm going there. And, and it makes sense to me on the other side of the cross to, to look at these verses and go, man, if that's true, if in him we live and move and have our being, if he's the one who gives us everything we need for life and for godliness, then it makes sense why, apart from Jesus, I felt lost and, and confused and, and in turmoil. And so I, I want you to, to give people grace, to extend grace and go, like, that should drive us to give people a, a, a chance to, to share this news, to, to be a, an ambassador for Christ to the kingdom of God right here in Fairview and beyond. Because people need to know how to live their life. And I don't know about you, but when I met Jesus, I found some, some purpose. I found some, some vision. I found some understanding that I'm not just here to fulfill my flesh. I'm here to, to do something. And so I believe that, that without question, we need to be people who, who start thinking about this. And as we ask these hard questions, as we, as we step toward this season, this, this series together, I want to invite us to... to to keep an open mind, but also be focused on these foundational pieces that we, that we lay. We aren't adding stuff to do. I'm not giving you a list of, hey, each week you're going to have a, a new responsibility from your church that you've got to accomplish this whole week. Like, if that's how you're hearing this, I'm telling you, that's burnt and broken. That's not what this is. But I want us to explore this book, and I want us to look toward heaven and ask God, how do we really, how do I experience everything you've given me? How do I, Jesus, go from believing that you've saved me from my sins, that I, that I no longer have to be, pay the penalty of my sin, but I get to inherit eternal life? Yes, someday in heaven, but also I can taste this, that, that future age, in this present evil age. And so, so how do I do it? How do I get there? As we do this, I'm not, I'm not adding to your yoke. I'm not adding to the yoke of Christ. We're simply revealing the opportunities that Jesus affords us when he says that he has offered us the abundant life and life to the fullest. So hear me say this. God loves you. God is for you and the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice while you were still a sinner was enough to cover you and, and, and welcome you into the kingdom forever. And now we can live the abundant life and learn the best practices by asking the question, how do I walk in his ways and how can I be conformed into his image? Because he first loved me. Beloved, that's where we're headed. And it's, it's on the foundation of Christ and his sacrifice. And the apostle Peter saying that, that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And the apostle Paul saying that it is in him that we live and move and have our being. Beloved, as we go forward into these unprecedented times, be filled and fueled with hope. That God has a plan to do something in you and then through you over these next few weeks. God bless you. Let's pray. Let's remember the word. Let's get into it this week and let it get into us and prepare our hearts to go forward asking the question of Jesus. How do I get the abundant life?